And now, to the millions and millions of listeners and viewers all across the world, Dale. it's the That's Not Christian Podcast. Come on, let's go. I know that in 2010 Bruh. you said you said you re you rededicated your life. Um, yes. So what was that transition? Were you still wrestling at that time? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. give us a little background of the I guess the wrestling business and I guess right, the right. pros and the cons or the things that you saw because obviously there must have been something that pushed you back to say I got to get recommitted. <laughs> <There was. laughs> this ain't the life I want to live. <laughs> there it was. So my mother was. My my gimmick, you know, Michael Tarver, the WWE wrestler, the son of a preacher and a prize fighter. It's true. My mother was really a minister. My father was a pro boxer. He was Mike Tyson's sparring partner. Wow. Like that's all true. Um, so I grew up in a church. So I knew God, but didn't know God. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I had a lot of stuff happen over the course of life. Got married, got divorced, fell away from God, stopped going to church, got mad at God, went through that whole rebellious stage and all of that. Got my, you know, I was homeless in 2005. Just, just, I went through some hell. Ended up getting a contract with WWE, homeless, like assigned the contract, wow. homeless, literally. Wow. And bro, like, yeah, it's it's so deep. Like, I literally, I moved to Florida from Ohio, from Akron, Ohio. Hey, LBJ. LBJ. <laughs> yes, sir. I mean, I'm originally, I'm from Cleveland, originally from Cleveland, but I, I lived in, lived in Akron. I grew up in Kent, Ohio, but I lived in Akron for a long time. Yo, yo, yo. Uh, yeah. So they, this all in the same. Oh, you, uh, cut, all right, cut his mic. Now. Cut <laughs> <laughs> no, I ain't saying I'm a LeBron. I'm just saying. I mean, I'm, just, I'm like a LeBron, no, but you know, you know. Um, I'm a LeBron yeah. hater. I might as well wear a shirt. LeBron hater right here. Mm, nah, I can't do that. Yeah. Nah, nah. Nah, that's, nah, nah. that's all good. Hey, Jay's voice got too high pitched for me. We got to cry. Right, right. Oh, no. <laughs> No, uh, uh, about Jay is still the goat. I'm with <laughs> Michael Jordan is still the goat. Let's go. There you go. There and that's go. the dude right, Jordan, I love it. LeBron James. This man's anointed. Is still the goat. This man's anointed hey. right here. Man. Bro, <laughs> you know, hey, hallelujah all day. <laughs> <laughs> but, nah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's good. So I signed my contract. Uh, I moved to Florida uh, the week before WrestleMania 24. WrestleMania 24. In 2008, and it was here in Orlando at the Citrus Bowl. The week before that, I was sleep. I was couch surfing. The week before that, I was wow. literally homeless, sleeping on somebody else's couch. So, and, so were you wrestling like like underground wrestling kind of thing? Yes. Like was it? Yes. Okay. Like local. So I, I wrestled on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I broke into the wrestling business in 2004, um, in Northeast Ohio, in Akron, Ohio, and and you know got. Got some success pretty quick. Had some some good brothers of mine that took me under their wing and trained me. They saw that I had potential, and you know I started traveling around the Midwest, like from like Philly all the way to Wisconsin, just just doing shows every weekend, just driving, doing shows, making nothing, <laughs> but wow. driving, doing shows just for the you love of wrestling. Yeah, that's how it starts, you know, which yeah. is horrible because you really, really dangerously putting your body on the line for literal peanuts. And when I say it's embarrassing, when I t- like I've literally. I have driven, I drove to Philly to wrestle for $75. Wow. <laughs> Bruh, like eight hours that, to Philly. And all that went $75. to gas, right? <laughs> gas went and gas food. and cheese steak. Like, man. No, no cheese bro, steak. We, <laughs> eight hour drive, bro. They don't eight, eight, one steak. way, one way. <laughs> one man, way. look, we, we drove to Philly one time, a few times, but like we would drive, it'd be four or five of us in the car. And we would get a Roach Motel. When I say Roach Motel, I really mean Roach Literally. Motel. Like yeah. the kind of joint that you don't peel back the cover on the bed. It's got blood in in, in the uh in the in the tub in the bathroom. Wow. Like yeah. that you sleep in your coat, your winter coat. And <laughs> the joints that cost like twenty dollars. You know wow. what I'm saying? Like and we we would just sleep on the floor in our coats freezing, you know what I'm saying? And but that was a sacrifice, you know, that that's what I had to do. And but yeah, when I got that contract, man. It was crazy, man. Like, so I was homeless, and a week later, I was in the main event of WrestleMania. And I remember um, standing behind the Citrus Bowl, there's fireworks going, like 80,000 people there. And I'm talking to Umaga and Rey Mysterio. And they were, I was introducing myself to them. And, you know, rest in peace, Umaga, big oos. But, like, I was was talking to them. I was in tears, like, 
bawling in tears. Like, I can't believe I'm here. Like, y'all don't understand. I was homeless last week. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is just the biggest, this even be standing here talking to y'all. Like I grew up watching y'all like, and they was like, yeah. okay, this dude, he hungry. He appreciates yeah. this. You know what I'm saying? And then I went and shook Ric Flair's hand right after his match. I was just going to ask Michaels. that. I was just going to ask uh, that. <laughs> bro, we were right after him. We were up right after him. You know what wow. I'm saying? It, like, it was it was them. And then I think Undertaker and Edge was like either right after us or something like that. We were right after Shawn Michaels and Ric Flair, if I remember correctly. And I remember walking yeah. up to him with tears in my eyes and said, I just shook his hand and just said, thank you. Wow. wow. So now yeah. you you were you were when you say we you got you was in a group right I, I was re- yeah. doing some research called next because I right. I'm a big I'm a big WWF fan or WWE fan right right for right. years and then I yeah. dropped off after a while I grew up and I was just like oh, me nah, too. I'm not watching this <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so like some of the newer wrestlers I'm like I don't I don't you know I can't even I can't even yeah, tell yeah, the crossfitters. <laughs> but so now you you guys came in as a group and got a contract or was it like you got a contract and then they put you in and they put you guys with the other wrestlers the, the next right nexus called. so what it was was when i got signed typically when anyone gets signed to wwe for the for the most part unless you're like aj styles or somebody whatever you go to develop you go to developmental first and you'll be under contract with wwe grinding two years before anybody ever knows your name or even knows you were signed unless they know you from where you're from. So, so I it's like D league, D league type of thing. Basically. Yeah. Basically. Okay. Yeah. And so they have a school where they train you and, you know, hone your, hone your, on your craft, work on your gear, work on your gimmick, work on your promos and just prepare you for TV basically. Mm-hmm. And literally less than 25% of the people who get signed to developmental actually make it to TV. And then less than mm-hmm. 15% of those people, actually might actually even debut and then less than 10% of those people become stars even after they debut. Like it's, it's, they weed you out. Wow. So I was there from 2008 until 2010 before the world even knew I existed. Wow. And wow. so what happened was they, um, they created a show they call, called NXT and they came to us and like, yo, we got this idea for this new show. Uh, so we're going to, we, they didn't actually even have a name for it yet. So we got, it's going to be a reality show and, you know, it's going to be kind of like tough enough was you're going to each rookie. You're going to have rookies and coaches and it's going to be the coach is going to be established superstars. Rookies are going to be eight guys from developmental. This is how we're going to debut you. So I was like, oh, like tough enough. I'm like, y'all going to have us doing pushups and stuff. Like, come on, man. Like what? <laughs> so it's like, no, it's going to be different. So I'm like, all right. So then they debuted us in February, 2010, you know, as a new show, new concept, it got good ratings and all of that. And then would they end up having us do these ridiculous challenges? But, you know, because they were just basically flying by the seat of their pants because that's what they do. And, <laughs> you know, I saw you so, was beating up legends. <laughs> Y'all was we, jumping so legends. Then, <laughs> yeah. So after, so what they did was how the Nexus was born, they, our season, which was the inaugural original season of NXT, ended. And then they, picked eight more guys from developmental eight more, you know, established wrestlers and then did the whole thing over again as season two. So then with season one, you know, because we were the biggest, you know, we just, we debuted, we were the first ones, whatever. They came up with these, uh, this idea to have us come out and jump John Cena. And (laughs) so, you know, we didn't actually even know about it. Here's the crazy, the wild thing about it. So I had got sent back to developmental for a couple of weeks after I, I was, I was the first person to be eliminated on the show and the show went on for like five more weeks or so, or whatever. So I'm back in developmental, like what's going on. And then they were like, all right, we need you to be in Miami for Monday night raw, or whatever, you know, the travel right. department would hit you up. And I'm like, okay, word, I'll be there. So I get there and the rest of everybody else is there. I'm like, what's going on? We didn't know all day long. So we get pulled into an office and it's Vince McMahon and, and, everybody all of the agents and producers so they're explaining to us here's what's going to go now <laughs> so in john cena and cm punk's match y'all are going to come out and destroy everything and we said <laughs> huh? everything i said no destroy everything like break cameras those cameras are like ten thousand yeah. dollar cameras and they were like uh... we everything's already been budgeted to be replaced you know if you everyone's getting bonuses like if you got to punch somebody punch them for like you know whatever like, <laughs> all of that, like yes like that? yeah there was like everybody getting bonuses and, like this needs to be wow. so convincing yeah it's, it's got to be real real like real real so we were like huh and it was like and if you don't if it don't it don't come out right you're fired like you they was like home. you're done wow. you go wow. home yeah. so we was like oh my 
And, <laughs> right. They said, so you're going to tear up the ring and you're going to tear up everything. It's never been done before. So then they walk around and hand us armbands, which became the Nexus armbands. We're like, uh, so they told us, you are never allowed to take those off. You better have those things on in the shower. If you're in the bed with your girlfriend, you better be wearing that armband. <laughs> wow. We were like, what? It's like, do not. So if you're seen in public with that thing off, somebody, you know, we call them stooges in the wrestling business, but a yeah. snitch will let us know and your backside is grass. Wow, so, look at that. Takashi is even before Takashi was out. Bruh. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but that's how it was. So like, we be pressure, in the gym. Right? <laughs> but, but it was genius because, man, let me tell you, we will be in the gym and people wouldn't know who we were, but they see that armband and be like, wait, and they run up on us and we also wasn't allowed to take pictures and do autographs. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Oh, right. Wow. Yep. Yeah. So, which in wrestling, you know, if you're a quote unquote a bad guy, you shouldn't anyway. Right. But that's, you know, old school psychologies, which is real right. psychology. But so we wouldn't do it. I can't tell you how many times I had mothers, I had a mother spit on me. I had to throw stuff at what? me because I refused to, in front of my, my, at the time, fiance and my daughter, like oh. cuss me out with her kid <laughs> out there. You're supposed to F you bleep, 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 bleep. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I can't. I'm sorry. I can't. I'm sorry. I can't. Like, I, I didn't even like be a bad guy heel to it. I just was like, I'm sorry. I can't do it. And I mean, it was genius wow. because word got around on the internet that we refused to sign people's autographs and take pictures. I remember walking into a house show in West Virginia, walking to the ring, being just rainy, trash, trash. Thrown they just hated you guys. They now. hated it. And that's what, and, but that was the idea. That's so I'm like, everything, the way they crafted it was genius, except of who they put in charge and how it finished. But that's a whole other story. And I'm not <laughs> talking about nobody in particular or anything. But, yeah. uh, Right, you know, <laughs> nah, you wouldn't no, even know no who way. it is because you can't see him. Right, so, yeah. right. <laughs> you know, that's like the Wizard of Oz, right? The guy right, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, he's the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> but um, so you yeah, so but it, it was yeah, but like we went out and we was just beating up everybody. So and then now, like over the past ten years, now they've it was so successful, and of course it got destroyed too fast. But they took that formula of what we did and just tried to recreate it over and over and over and over, like with the shield and all of this new group. Like it's like wrestling is so unoriginal, but can be original at the same time. It's so weird. And even with the mask thing, like people don't people like, it's so funny. And I don't say this very much. I know how it comes across, but I got so much swag all over this wrestling business. People don't even realize it because mm. I kind of got buried, but the masks people don't realize that I wasn't necessarily the first person to ever wear a half mask covering half my face, yeah. per se. But when I did, everybody started wearing masks everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Roman Reigns finisher, the Superman punch. It's an MMA strike. Mm -hmm. And so I was a boxer, so my finisher was a knockout punch. So I started doing the Superman punch, you know, to keep it different from the right. big show who had a knockout punch. That's a whole other story. Um, and then all of a sudden I got released, whatever, next thing you know, Roman Reigns is doing the Superman punch. And everybody thinks they, you know, everybody's copying that because they think they got it from him. Right. He's a cool dude. Like he knows where he got it from. He's, he's, I 100% <laughs> support Roman Reigns. He's a great dude. Yeah. But, you know, this is just, uh, you know, uh, so many things, just like people wearing masks and all of that. And, and then just next, then there's another group called Undisputed. They wear armbands in NXT, <laughs> just like we did, same colors. And, and I know. So you, you got a lot of sons guys. out here. Of, yeah, I right. guess you can say that, but I yeah, mean, those dudes like that, they're, they're amazing wrestlers, undisputed. They're, they're right. disgusting yeah. wrestlers. Amazing. Right. So, I, I know three of them, but so now you know, when you, when you, yeah. when you, when you're wrestling right in the WWE, yeah. um, now I've heard wrestlers complain about their mm. the business aspect, right? Uh, <laughs> kind of like, I yeah. guess you guys are more like independent contractors than actual employees. Or is that, is that, uh, <laughs> that's a it's the myth and the truth so we are independent contractors so they we have to do our own taxes basically yeah. mm. like okay. it's a 1099 type of deal because i was told but, that you guys got to pay your hotel you got to pay your flight yes you gotta yeah no 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 we got to pay our own hotel and rental car we don't pay our own flight own they flight. they okay. cover the flight yeah because if that if that wouldn't be possible it wouldn't be right. possible to fly every week and there yeah, that's like when i was there I was covering and it was a group of us. So it was actually easier to do, but then you get really savvy too when you're traveling. Cause 
you learn how to use the Expedias and all of that, and you just don't <laughs> stay at some you know four or five star hotel. You just you, you pick a decent enough hotel, get that get that discount. Get on Groupon, <laughs> bro. Get on Groupon, right? Get that. You pick a you know a, a, a rental car you know place. You pick one, build a relationship, get points. You know, get airline points, and and you do that, and right. you end up saving money if you do it correctly. Yeah. You know, and it got to a point where, and my ex fiance, right, whatever she worked for Sheraton, so like she would actually be able to get us discounts. You know, nice. so like I had the hustle going, and. It, I end up spending, I will spend about three, between three and five hundred dollars a week on rental cars and, and hotels, you know, wow. and, but I could afford it, you know, but it was still kind of wild I'm thinking that, you know, I was spending five, almost five hundred dollars a week just to go to work, you know. Right. But again, if I'm traveling the world in the country, then that's just it is what it is. But. Yeah, they pay for the flights, you know, but and, and I, from what I was told, wrestlers get paid more than we did anyway. So, yeah, but mm-hmm. yeah, so, so you're an independent you're... contractor, but, you know, you can't work for nobody else, though. No, it's it's where it's conflict. Not, not like Uber and Lyft. Uh-huh. Man. <laughs> like, like, God forbid you show up on a commercial somewhere, you know, as a WWE wrestler, you can't do it unless they give you permission to. And they only give you permission if you have favor in the office. Mm-hmm. Uh, they get to determine who gets. It's a lot of, a lot of politics in there alone. Yep. So they're giving three sixty yep. deals, pretty much. Bro, it's <laughs> the first three sixty deal. Right? Everything they own your name. They own the <laughs> Real. man, and they taking man, they they taking dinner off your table. Man, yeah. I mean, it so was now, cool. it was a blessing, man. But, right. you know, but it was crazy. You lived though. your dream. You, you you were living your dream, right? Like something that one you, of them. You, yeah, one of them. One of them. My dream wasn't to be a pro wrestler like that, though. Like I grew up watching wrestling, but like my dream was to be a rapper. I was about to say, uh, what came first, the rap or the or the wrestling? Well, you said twenty years ago, right? You yeah. started rapping. So yeah, like I started. It was it was. I don't know. I guess you could say wrestling came first because I grew up wrestling. Grew up watching wrestling, like you know, with my parents. Mm, yeah. And my father was a pro athlete, you know. So I I wanted to be a pro athlete. You know, what I'm saying I, that was. Really, what I wanted to be a professional athlete. I wanted to travel for work, and but I also wanted to be a rapper. Like I was always into music. You know, my father sang, my mother sang, we sang in in church and all of that. You know, typical story. And like when I was in high school, I taught myself how to play the drums. You know, what I'm saying like it's just it's just there's a lot of things that added up to or led to what became my love for music. And I always learned things phonetically. Like I can hear something and imitate it, and that's mm. how I learned how to rap. Like I was listening to Special Ed and Big Daddy Kane and, and you know, mimicking their rhyme patterns and mimicking and I would hear their punchlines and then create my own punchline similar to what they and just and just write and write and write and write. And at like 15 years old, you know what I'm saying? And yeah, but like I wanted to be a professional athlete. So I guess the WWE thing was perfect uh, in that regard because I was an athlete, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, I really like my heart's desire, man. I wanted to be a rapper, man. Like I just I wanted to be. Oh man! So yeah. now, in the middle of wrestling, yeah, was there a transition like while you were in the WWE, or was it after? Spiritu- was it spiritually, like, yeah, spiritually, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. So when I first moved here, I still wasn't going to church. I still wasn't really in in the church. And my ex uh, at the time, she was in church, and she was like, "You know, it's a big deal to me to go to church." So I'm like, "All right, where I go to church with you?" So we went to church at her parents' church, and it was not my kind of church. And I felt like I wouldn't get nothing out of it. So we ended up finding Crossover Church in Tampa with, you know, Pastor Tommy, Urban Pastor, D. Yeah, Tommy. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, shout out to Urban D. And so we was like, all right, a hip hop church? Wait, they got a recording studio? They got, wait, what? Right. Would this <laughs> exist? This is real? Perfect. <laughs> so we so we went and I'm like, I fell in love immediately. Man, like, I went, I was like, dude, they got dudes rapping on stage? Like with the choir? Why they do that? <laughs> I fell in love. Like and I'm like, I can I ain't gotta dress up. I can wear my Tims and I can dress like a gangbanger if I wanted to. <laughs> like what? You know what I'm saying? And it was just, it was man, it was just such a it just the experience was amazing. And then I ended up leaving the church. I had a got divorced, you know, and just hadn't went through and then just went through a whole bunch of personal stuff. But while during that time period, that was 2010, I had a spiritual awakening, which is probably like my first big one right which led to the others that have happened in recent years and so i was going through in 2009 
I was this close to debuting before Nexus, before the and NXT was even a thing. And my experience in developmental was real rough. Like it, they played mind games. I fought, kicked, scratched, like all of this, like equality, all of this stuff. Like I was going through some hell back then. And wasn't on social media complaining about it, playing a victim. I was just, was just grinding because I had kids to take right, care of. Right. And I was homeless, you know, and I was older than everybody. I got signed. I was 31 years old when I got signed. And I'm uh-huh. in there hanging with 20-somethings, you know, who want to hang out all night and drink and, and do drugs and all of that stuff. And I'm just chilling with them like, uh, you have fun with that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But so there was a point where I ended up not being able to debut because I didn't have a passport. And, it, and it, one of the talent relations assistants was trying to make me feel like I was about to lose my job. And I was going crazy. Like, I can't do that. I can't go back to Ohio. I can't. I'm a, I can't. I'll be a failure. I can't. I can't. I can't. And I just started having these crazy spiritual attacks. And this is before I realized what they were. And the crazy thing, I haven't told the story in a while. So this is right around Halloween. So I went and saw the movie Paranormal Activity. I don't know if you mm-hmm. remember that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have always had this sick fascination with finding a movie that actually scares me right because i never you know because i would i experienced some things growing up you know as a believer we experienced things and i had some a lot of wild crazy spiritual attacks mm-hmm. growing up like that, that would mm-hmm. you probably wouldn't believe me if i told you right so i thought to myself all right if i've seen some of the things i've seen in real life ain't no way a movie gonna scare me right <laughs> so i went and saw this movie spirit uh, so okay here's what happened we go to a haunted house never been to a haunted house before in my life always wanted to go Never went. So I finally, I went to this haunted house. No, we went and saw the movie first. Went and saw the movie first. The movie was everything that I experienced when I was a kid. I, I saw it play out on the big screen. Wow. wow. And it, it was traumatizing. Like, it was like legitimately traumatizing. And I'm sitting there like, like almost trembling. Like, what what did I just do to myself? What just happened? You know what I'm saying? And my ex looking like, you all right? I'm like, uh, like, I didn't know what to say. Like, I was tr- like, when I saw that movie, literally what what i saw in that movie i experienced as a kid like real deal like no lie and i'm like that i never had that happen before like where i actually like saw it again and it brought back memories and things that i buried i guess i didn't realize and i'm I'm like i just was overcome with so much like flooded and then we go to a haunted house and you know how they jump out at you and all of that. What was yeah. that? <laughs> Just it was like all of these crazy, like demonic images and all of that, you know. And, and I'm like, you I'm walking nobody, through, like, you? just like I feel like someone I got did. Superman punched. You did. Yeah, that's I what I see. You can't be jumping out on this big dude, yeah, <laughs> bro. And like, it was like it just I was. It was literally almost like having PTSD, like, and and, mm. and you know, being a soldier got PTSD at a fireworks, you know, show yeah, it on Fourth yeah, yeah. of July. You feel what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like walking through this little house, jumping out at me and all the imagery. And I'm like trying to hide that I'm not good, you know, for my girl at the time. And somebody jumped out at me that that one good time. And I grabbed him. I was like, all right, it's time to go. Time to go. Time to go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. wow. you didn't talk so, no, no, I just grabbed him. But I I realized like, oh, 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 you know what I'm saying? I was like, I, I, yeah. Right. Like, I got to go. I got to go. That led to like a, that was like October 2009 into like November. That led to like a month. I didn't sleep. I, I didn't hardly eat. I, I went crazy. I didn't shave, didn't cut my hair. Like I, I felt like I was hearing voices. I was seeing things. I was like, uh, just, I was sit up at night. Like just, you know, just, it was, I was shook. Like, you know what I'm saying? And then, then the talent relation dude was like, yo, you're about to get fired because you don't blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what the, you know, like the enemy was really, the enemy was like, yeah, got him, got him, got him. Mm. And then, you know, I came up with a character or whatever that was kind of born out of that situation. And that's what, kind of turned the corner for me and the story of the character was that never made it to tv that they loved the name michael tarver so originally my name was tyson tarver after two boxers which is so original but they came up with that mike tyson antonio tarver Mm. that's wwe for you so i ended up losing the name tyson tarver because tyson kid debuted for the heart heart dynasty so i was like all right so they're calling me mr tarver and that was when mr kennedy was still at wwe i'm like nah, they about to call me you know, hot dog banana shack or something like that. You know what I'm <laughs> I come up with a name. They were good for that. Like they were real good for that. You know what I'm saying? So I was not about to be, you know, hot dog or something. So I was like, all right, let me come up with a name. So I came up with Michael, you know what I'm saying? As in Archangel Michael. So I was like, all right, Michael Tarver, you know, whatever. Then a friend of mine was having a conversation with me about the movie Crossroads. I don't know if you remember that movie, like old school with Ralph Macchio, Cry the Kid, 
story of uh, the guitar yeah. dude, Bobby Johnson or something, sold his soul to the devil at the crossroads, whatever. Mm-hmm. So I don't know why he kept, we, this dude like 19 years old too. And I'm like, what you know about that movie? So we talking about it. And then one day I was sitting, I'll never forget, man, y'all bringing up some memories. So this is a crazy, so <laughs> I was sitting in my living room after practice, waiting on Max to get home by myself, right? And I had my laptop playing, you know, some music or whatever. And this is when I was still just really about to start diving into Christian hip hop. Um, and it had just, just, you know, some music playing. So Lucifer, Jay-Z song, Lucifer came on. And I'm Lucifer sitting there. The yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I ended up, I was washing dishes. Or something. Actually, no, I was in the kitchen washing dishes. And a song came on and something came over my spirit. Like, it was like, like. You ever like been in a room where the AC comes on over you, like the vents over you, you feel it wash down over you. Mm -hmm. Like I physically felt something come over me and I turned and looked at the computer, like almost like somebody was trying to break in the window, like what in the world? And it was that song playing and I stopped and I listened to it. I was like, my spirit just was, was just messed up. And I'm like, okay, okay, wait a minute. What is going on with me? So I sat and I turned it off and I sat and sat and sat. And I just kept thinking about the conversation about the movie. And then I created the character, the Michael Tarver character, which was angel on one shoulder, devil on the other. And I would do these promos where I would. So what ended up happening was I went to back to back to training and Dusty Rose was the co- was the coach and him and I, he was my mentor. And I was like, yo, I got a new gimmick. I got something. Just trust me. Let me try it. He said, all right, cool. So I pulled out one of the re- Heath Slater, who ended up being in the Nexus. I said, do me a favor. Just stand here. Start talking. When I start talking, don't say nothing. Just flow with me. He said, okay, cool. So I walked up to him, approached him, you know, kind of talking really, you know, really nice, whatever. Like, hey, how you doing? Whatever, blah, blah, you know, whatever. Let me ask you a question. You ever feel like you had an angel on one shoulder and I walk over to his other shoulder and say a devil on the other? And that would completely juxtapose my entire posture and my voice and everything. And then, right. So like as if I was the angel on and the devil on his shoulder. Mm -hmm. And basically I was looking into the camera saying the things that he wanted to say to the office, basically, that he couldn't say about you know right. how he was super talented, was getting held back, but I was saying it for him. Right, right, he was just right. standing there, wow. and it was like cheat code, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and got a standing ovation. And wow. so I would pull you know different wrestlers. It, it got to a point where like, yo, yo, use me for that, use me for that, because they saw what I was doing. Right. And then the main roster, you know, office and all that, they got wind of that. And they came down and wanted to see me do it live. And I did it. And they were like with Alberto Del Rio, as a matter of fact. It was before him and I both debuted. So I did the promo with him. And they were like, my just mouths just dropped like we've never seen anything like this. And like for people who've had, you know, who've worked with The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin or whatever, to look at me and be like, we've never seen anything like this. The gimmick was dangerous because mm-hmm. as I'm doing the gimmick, I felt there were times I would lose control when I would do the devil on the on the shoulder gimmick. I would literally lose control of what I was saying. You get into and lose control of my, too much. Too much. <laughs> it was it was dangerous. Mm-hmm. So when I got on the main roster, I started experiencing things, noticing things or whatever. And some like weird, like, you know, Mason type stuff. Like, you feel for like real, you could lose real. yourself in that. Yes. Like I started noticing some stuff. And one day I was listening to uh, Dietrich Haddon, a song he had called I'm Alive. And we had just flown back to Tampa and I was standing in the baggage claim waiting on my ex and I had my headphones on, dozens of fans, you know, trying to get autographs and that song is playing and I just broke into tears right there. And this is oh. in 2010, like right in the middle of the airport, just like I couldn't even stop it. I'm trying to cover my face and fans asked for autographs and I started running out the door like I couldn't stop myself from crying and I jumped in the car She's like, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't know. I don't know. And I just was crying. And the song was just blasting. And it just resonated with me because I had a huge problem with depression. Like right before I got signed, I almost committed suicide. So mm-hmm. like it, it just was what it just resonated with me. And then God was bringing all of those things together. And when that happened, that was right. All of that stuff was happening at the same time when I joined Crossover and all of that. And when I finally stopped listening to all of the secular music, and I was listening to Tech Nine heavy back then too. It was so crazy. <laughs> but like when I just I literally put down all my secular music, even Eminem, I'm a huge Eminem fan, just put it all down and just 100 percent committed to only listening to CHH. Like just just told myself I'm flipping it 100 percent And it okay. kind of saved my life. You know wow. what I'm saying? And so I started introduced it to my kids. And I, and that's been a huge factor of my son that I mentioned who plays in mm-hmm. college. Of him and him and I bonding. There's a huge factor in that. 
because we listen to the same music. Like he listens to Christian hip hop, and that's been a huge factor in, you know, him growing up and and becoming the young man he is, you know, oh, and Praise that God. leading to where we are today, you know. I know. I'm sorry. I'm a long way. That's a no. Nah, that's a, that's, that's a that's big like, that's uh, a dope story. That's testimony. A dope yeah. story and a big shout yeah. out to CHH for those oh, who, yeah. who you know yeah. are skeptical or they're like, like we got to see how God uses that music, man. It, uh, he uses it for sure, man. Because like it, it helped me further bond with my son. You know what I'm saying? Like with you know with my children, but like in particular my son. And I remember my father and I, you know, we grew up listening to the same music. I listened, he listened to cool music and I liked it. He listened to Public Enemy, you know, he listened to uh, Zapp and Roger, you know, the Funkadelics, mm. all that. I love that music, you know what I'm saying? Right. And he, he didn't listen to old school Four Tops and The Temptations, which is great. He listened right. to cool music. Right. And that music, <laughs> the, you know, it, it played a part in influencing my production, like, you know, and it just, I, I saw that as very important, man. It just, one thing is I love about I love about one of the many things I love about CHH is that it's safe, mm -hmm. even if it's not the most Christiany Christian hip hop, right? It's safe. You can play it you anywhere, huh? You can play it anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I mean, and granted, there are some that people won't know the difference, but I'm like, you know, and there have been places where I played it with kids I work with, and people are like, whoa, 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 we don't play that kind of music. I said, listen for five seconds, yeah. <laughs> take about thirty seconds, and listen to what I'm playing. Right, and then then there's that. Well, we can't do anything religious. I'm like, it's not religious, uh, but there are no cuss words. There's no profanity. There's no overly sexual content. There's right, no violence. Right, right. The spirit behind and it, the spirit, mm -hmm. and the spirit behind it. But like, the, the, you know, you'll play WAP because it relates to the kids, you know, and mm -hmm. you want to relate to them, but you don't realize you're teaching them to go have premarital sex, or you know, you're not to sound churchy, but you're teaching them to go have sex next week, and they're 14, right. whereas. I'm just playing music that sounds like what they like to listen to. They may reject it because it's not who they like, but at least they, they're bobbing their heads to it because, mm -hmm. unfortunately, they're easily brainwashable, mm -hmm. you right. know? But, man, it just, right. it's just it's grown me, changed me in so many ways, man, listening to Dope. Bizzle, Cray, R. Swift. I remember now, meeting wow, R. Swift. R. Swift. Yeah. Bro, I remember meeting R. Swift in Atlanta, man, in 2000, uh, I want to say 11, 2011 to 2012 at a city tickets conference in Atlanta with Scott Free. I went with Urban D and him and I sat down and he was like, yo, you know, I, I told him what it was and everything. And he was like, man, this is what you got to do. He gave me advice. He said, do freestyles. The idea to do the freestyles, like literally the control verse, all of that came from our swip. Like he uh -huh. said, do freestyles. I'm like, okay, I never done that before. He said, do them and post them. Just keep doing them. Keep doing them. So I started posting freestyles to my YouTube in 2012, or whatever, you know what I'm saying? And then I eventually stopped, but I just got to record them in my car and talk a little bit and then post. And, but then I finally started doing it again in 2018. I had posted a freestyle to a website, a site called a uh, 90 sip up junkie. I don't know if y'all familiar, Yeah. but mm -hmm. they did a contest and it was the fourth chamber B and you, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, you post your freestyle or whatever they like it. They repost it to their page when well, they reposted mine. I was like, oh, and I straight, the first thing I said was Christian rapper. You know, he whacked wow. your Christian rapper life, but then people listened to it like, oh, dude was fire. And so I saw that, I'm like, wait a minute, let me keep, you know, keep submitting stuff. And then I did a verse to the uh, rep uh, Respiration Beat. And that was even better, but they didn't repost that one. So I'm like, all right, whatever. I just keep doing it myself. And they just, you know, doing, just posting freestyles. So, over so now over. with all that, what, yeah. What do you have? Uh, what do you have going on now? I know you said you dropped. You dropped a few. Did you drop a mixtape this year? Was it? Was it two this of them? Year? Two, two of them. them. So you, you dropped two mixtapes. Yeah. yeah. Where they? Where can the people find that at? Gotcha. So there, there's the monster <laughs> tape one and two, and uh, right there on SoundCloud and Noisetrade.com. I've really been trying to get them on that pip. I don't know why it's hard to upload stuff to that pip, but you know, maybe I need a team. But now yeah, right you, now it's just on that on uh noisetrade.com and uh SoundCloud. And you working on an album now or you working on more mixtapes? What, what what's going on now musically? Both. So um the Monster Tape three, I'm you know, I'm I'm slowly working on that but yeah i'm working on the album i done recorded about 60 joints in the past wow. year wow. Album. Like, work. I put, work. yeah so like when in like in 2015 when i find like urban d gave me the game man in 2010 when i met him he was like yo 
I was like, I want to sign with Reach. I want to sign with Reach, you know, because I had that I'm with WWE, so maybe I should get with the biggest Christian hip hop label I, mentality, mm. which was right. misguided. He was like, No, nah, don't. Yeah, <laughs> he was like, No, nah, don't do that. You got to do it on your own. He showed me, told me about CD Baby and all of that. So right. I was like, look, all at right. look at Jay. Look at Jay. Look at Jay. Reach one one six hat. You, he's, he's, he's on the payroll. Right there. He's on, on the payroll. Reach, he's going. He's, he's on payroll right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, he wasn't dissing Reach. He was just saying, like, you know, like do it on your own. You got to yeah. like, you know, yeah. So, yeah. And so he does. He does it. He's independent with his, and he's good. He's successful. You know. So I. 2015, I finally figured out how to, you know, copyright, get publishing and all of that, yeah. and then put together, you know, a studio, you know, a little makeshift studio, whatever, and then learn how to record myself all over again and, you know, produce all over again and then, you know, mix the best I could or whatever and then put, you know, and then release it to iTunes, all of that. And, right. and then yeah. just from that point, I was just releasing just joint after joint after That's joint dope. after joint. That's and dope. I think I would record it. I record about five or six songs a day. I would sit at home all day and just record song, song, wow. song, song, dope song, work song. ethic right there. Yeah, like just, just but I was learning. Play. I was learning. You know what I'm yeah. saying? I had to learn what my voice sounded like, my cadence, where I'm comfortable, what kind of beats I'm at home with, how to use my voice. You know, how to sing, when I, how to harmonize, how to edit, how to make th- you know make things crisp. You know, you know what I'm saying? Just I had to learn, relearn. That is. Yeah. So, so you got some so, stuff on Spotify too. I do, yes, yeah. Okay, so they so, can find your what monster Tava? Well, uh, so originally my name was B two point oh, and I got some good advice to change that. <laughs> but, <laughs> got some good advice to change that, but uh, so you can find music, my older music. You know, if you search B two point oh or B two point oh backslash two point oh sound, it's a lot to say, and it was a horrible name, but. That was my rap name from back when I was rapping 20 years ago. So I figured I'd just stay with that. But I got some good advice to change it to M. Tarver because it's close to my wrestling name. Right. Mm. And so, but yeah, so I do have stuff on Spotify. Um, if you search Monster Tarver or M. Tarver, like none of my pro- projects, but uh, I got a song with features. BRM Features. Yeah. Um, nice. A song with BRM, uh, a song with a Second Samuel on his album he just released, Brother Named Second Samuel. Um, we heard of him. Yeah, yeah, that's my, yeah, that's my yeah. homie. And so, um, uh, theme song, uh, it's called You Will Believe in Me with another, with a, a guitarist named John Kernan. But it's from my brother, uh, PJ Black, or Justin Gabriel. He was in the Nexus. So I did his theme song for him. And oh, that's, wow. you can find that. Yeah, so that's another thing, the theme song hustle, man. Like, the wrestlers be hitting me up now. Like, after that, like, yo, can you up? Uh, yeah, that's like, dope. Want some bars yeah, that's like, like, music. Okay. That commercial bag. <laughs> yeah. Get that so, string. And, and be rock <laughs> beats, too. That's the crazy thing, is they be rock beats, man. But it, with the crazy, like, I, that was what I was doing, was like rock, rock and roll rap back in the mm-hmm. day. Mm-hmm. And the label I was signed to in, like, 2001, they didn't really understand what to do with me because I was, they was like a gangster, Midwest gangster rap label and I was doing rock and roll rap. So they didn't know what to do with me. You know what I'm saying? So it's cool. Like I'm at home with it, you know? Yeah, man. Well, listen, man, we appreciate you, man. We're yeah. going to drop uh, all his links, right? His, uh, yeah. your at name on IG is Monster Tarver, right? Uh, IG, Twitter, uh, my Twitter. Fan, fan page, everything. Tw- uh, TikTok, all that. I don't do Monster TikTok Tarver. dances though. No. So we gonna drop the link. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't on TikTok. You ain't doing those challenges. Nah, no, I, I, if it's a rap challenge, yes. But I, I, I ain't doing no dances, my guy. Doing no dances <laughs> challenge. <laughs> but we appreciate you, man. You, yo, how tall are you, man? I was about to ask oh. that. Oh, I'm six three, man. Six, oh, I'm about God. to say because I thought he was like. Yeah. You look like six seven, man. You, you know, <laughs> that, yeah. me, was, what, we talking about the pick with me and Dayton. Yeah, well, that too. I'm yeah. trying to say dating short, man. What y'all trying to say dating short? <laughs> you told, Yo, but it, it threw me off because I, I went on YouTube, right, to see some of your yeah. fights, and you were fighting this giant, man. And I was like, wait, how tall is this dude? You know? Oh, bro, yeah. I think I was talking about you. He's legit seven foot tall, but no, I'm six three. He made me look little, little. <laughs> yeah. That's a, yeah and I was like, little. wait, how tall is Dayton? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> he going to get at me too, like, yo, yo, son. <laughs> That's the big homie, man. Shout out to Dayton, man. Shout out to Dayton. Y'all don't even know, man. Little That's big so homie, Menace uh, Movement, and all big everybody. Big Menace Movement, G-O-M. Yeah, uh, Bizzle, oh, for sure. the whole G-O-M, man. They stay coming with smoke.
Yeah. <laughs> we appreciate you up. and your humility, man. Wow, man. Like, a, hey, like, story, like what they call piracy, it, a gentle, a gentle giant. <laughs> for sure, for sure. That's yeah, yeah. Appreciate now, the best man. Yeah. Well, with that being said, we want to thank everybody for listening, viewing. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. If you want to learn more about Monster Tavra, just hit the description or the show notes. Have all his links there, all his music, everything. And uh, thank you again. Make sure you, you copy your merch. We got some new merch at shop.that'snotchristian.com. Make sure you copy. And uh, we'll see you next week. Peace. Peace. Peace.